Happy almost Valentine's Day. It's okay. You can be excited about that. Do you guys have good plans for Valentine's Day? Yeah? I would love to put people on the spot. Anyone, anyone proposing on Valentine's Day? I saw a hand in the back. I would love to put you on the spot too. Well, tonight's talk, if you haven't picked up on yet, is not going to be about Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm talking about singleness tonight. It's also cool. I know, it's also cool. Uh, but let me, let me be clear. I do want to be clear from the start. Uh, this is not an anti-Valentine's message or an anti-romance message. Romance is great. Uh, it's not the kingdom of God, which is the best. But it's pretty great. So is singleness. Or at least that's part of what I want to argue tonight. I've entitled this talk, Plundering Singleness. It's a very intentional metaphor. I'm using the metaphor of plundering for a couple reasons. Consider what it means to plunder. Plundering is a form of theft. It's usually a particularly grand and violent form of, threat, of theft. You, you wouldn't rightly accuse someone who stole a Snickers from a 7-Eleven of plundering. You'd uh, say they stole, but you wouldn't say they plundered. You, you'd call it pilfering or lifting or nicking or nabbing. It's not plundering doesn't have the dignity of plundering. It's not plunder until a person steals, say, a boat full of gold. Now, the other thing about plundering is we don't plunder from our friends. We plunder from our enemies, or at the very least, from strangers towards whom we feel no responsibility. Pirates plunder merchant ships. In war, the victor plunders the vanquished, riding off with treasure and often a train of prisoners of war. See, those who plunder get rich quick off the effort of others, taking another's treasure and making it their own. I know plundering is not exactly the most virtuous of activities to be talking about in a chapel. Christians aren't supposed to steal. They're not even supposed to nick and nab and pilfer, much less plunder. But consider that the most famous biblical example of plundering was sponsored by the Lord himself. It was the Lord who told Moses to tell the Israelites to ask their neighbors. And this is bizarre. Go ask your neighbors for their silver and gold jewelry, will you? Exodus 12 tells us that the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. Now, the early church took this idea and ran with it. Their Egypt was the long tradition of pagan philosophical learning, which they plundered in the name of Jesus, taking terms and concepts and images and repurposing them for the gospel's sake. Martin Luther did something similar. In an age when congregational singing just didn't, I mean, this would never have happened in Luther's age. In that age, Luther took some of the better tunes from the club or from the pub uh, as it were in his time, and he gave them evangelical lyrics. He was repurposing these songs in the name of Jesus. So, why speak of plundering singleness? Well, for starters, because so many of us consider the single life as enemy territory. Even, it's, even if it's where we live, so many of us hate it. It's Egypt. We're eager to move elsewhere. We devise ways of escape, plotting routes out of the enemy territory. At best, we tolerate it, spending our days dreaming of the promised land of romance and marriage. What I want to suggest tonight is that rather than wasting our waking hours, hatching plots to get unsingle as fast as possible, we instead look around at all the loot stashed around us and plunder it. The single life is rich with treasure for those who simply have the eyes to see it and the guts to plunder it. Now, I suppose I could have described all this in terms of stewarding your singleness, and, and I find that word really helpful, actually. We've been given our singleness for as long as we have it. For what do we have? What do we have that we haven't received from the Lord? And therefore, the single life isn't something that we possess 
and can use however we see fit, but is instead something that we've been given responsibility to manage for the Lord's purposes. In fact, maybe this would have been a better way to speak tonight. So often we get lost in the longing and the loneliness of singleness, trapped in a maze of self-concern. Instead of participating in God's mission in the world, we lose our lives and not in the Jesus sense. We just lose them. We squander them in a narcissism that won't rest until we find a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a husband, a wife. Trouble is, at that point, we then put all our eggs in a romance basket so that when we are lucky enough to find that someone, we've lost the sense of why God might want to give us such a someone in the first place. We gorge ourselves on togetherness without a thought of giving ourselves away to the world for the sake of the kingdom. As if romance were what it was all about. As if it weren't all about the kingdom. The kingdom for whose sake I'm called to steward my singleness, my marriage, for whose sake I'm called to steward my whole life. But I worry that too often those of us who think and talk about singleness, and I've been thinking about singleness for about a quarter century. I figured out it's been about a quarter century that I've been in the dating range. Don't be jealous. <laughs> I think those of us who think and talk about singleness fall into this trap <clears throat> of envisioning it as a form of martyrdom. Heroic, to be sure, an expression of our devotion to Jesus, but perhaps also a life of destitution, meager, emaciated, joyless. Look at that single person. She's amazing. Look what she does for Jesus. Her life sucks, but it's so impressive, right? That's the best we can do sometimes. In insisting to, you have thought that thought, by the way. Some of you are really happy to be heroes for Jesus, but you're like, till 26? Because then it would just suck, right? <laughs> so insisting tonight that singleness be plundered, I want to I wanna suggest and argue and conjole you into believing that it is a lavish life, full of riches to be exploited for the sake of an abundant life in Christ. This is a likely place in which to live abundant life. The abundant life doesn't wait for you on the other side of the wedding day. It sets the table for you here and now. So let me suggest four ways that we might plunder our singleness. And I decided I may as well start big. The first way we can plunder our singleness is to befriend loneliness. I want to ask you a question, and I want to give you about 30 seconds of silence. I'm just going to be silent after I ask it to consider it. What would you do if you knew that you would be lonely for the rest of your life? What would you do if you knew that you would be lonely for the rest of your life? Loneliness may just be the greatest gift of the single life. And don't get me wrong, loneliness sucks. When I'm lonely, I want often desperately to get unlonely as quickly as possible. All my energies go to casting out the throbbing feeling of aloneness that threatens to consume me. The end of every semester with the sudden cessation of activity, I find myself profoundly lonely, disorientingly lonely. This Christmas, I ached from loneliness. Nothing had changed about my life. I was home in San Diego with parents who loved me deeply and I was beside myself. I'd love to tell you that at almost 40, I now know that loneliness is reserved for the young, but that's not so. I'd love to tell you too that if you started dating someone, if you marry someone, your loneliness will be over. But that's not so either. 
I'll never forget talking to a newly married young man about a lonely season in my own singleness, and he stopped me in my tracks telling me, you've never known loneliness like the loneliness you feel lying in bed next to someone. What if loneliness was our lot in this broken life? I don't don't say this to court cynicism or invite despair. I want to exhort you, though, to acceptance. You will be lonely, brothers and sisters. Count on it. Some of you are lonely right now. Some of you will find loneliness setting in on your walk back to the dorm tonight. After the initial rush of exhilaration, you'll experience any dating relationship you have as a context of occasional loneliness, perhaps more than occasional loneliness. If loneliness is here to stay, then the desperate, all-encompassing project of reducing or eliminating loneliness at all costs, as if loneliness were the worst thing in the world, is a fool's errand. What would it look like to welcome loneliness as a friend? or at least as an inevitable neighbor who stops by, welcome or not, from time to time. Well, first, I think it wouldn't, I think it would mean that we didn't primarily consider loneliness a problem to be solved immediately and at all costs. We might instead consider how to exploit it for the sake of our formation as disciples of Jesus. We might see it as a site in which we might meet the Father. For years, I've had this three by five card, uh, Right now, it's sitting at my desk. Well, not right now. Uh, it says, Desiderium sinus cordus. It's words from St. Augustine in Latin. Longing makes the heart deep. Longing makes the heart deep. In loneliness, we ache for intimacy. We yearn to be seen and known and loved and touched. What if, among other things, this loneliness signaled the friendship for God for which we were made? What if it were thus an invitation to cultivate friendship with God by laying bare our need for him, our thirst for relationship? What's the psalmist's confession that his soul longs for God the way a deer pants for water, but the cry of the lonely? You have the cry of the lonely in your Bible. What if, too, our loneliness illuminated our need for intimacy with others? What if it's a sign of subtle ways in which we've wandered away from relationship? Perhaps it can become, rather ironically, a bridge back to fellowship. I've learned the value of being blunt. I tell my friends when I'm lonely. Without asking them to somehow exercise my loneliness, who can do that? I ask them if they can be with me as I'm lonely. That seems key to me. If we expect relationships to drive out the darkness of loneliness, we set them up for failure. A friend once wrote to me that she and her husband, quote, continued to be astonished at the potential for loneliness, even in marriage. Some of our best moving forward, she wrote, has been to stop demanding of the other one that we not be lonely. We will be lonely. And we can't banish our own loneliness or demand that another banish hers but we can be with one another in loneliness. Faithful friends who bear silent witness to the faithful, even present God. We may still be lonely, but we'll be lonely with one another. Jesus was lonely too. Do you know that Jesus, the one who in eternity enjoyed perfect communion with the Father and the Spirit, became lonely for your sake? Think of his frustration at his three friends who couldn't even stay awake to bear his burden with him in prayer. Think of his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane and the utter loneliness of his final hours, his disciples scattered, himself forsaken in death. We will be lonely, but Jesus, the lonely one, is our constant companion. Jean Vanier spent his life in community with disabled persons. Late in life, he wrote a beautiful book I'd commend to you called Becoming Human. Vanier begins with the universal fact of loneliness in this world that groans and waits. And for Vanier, loneliness becomes productive. But this loneliness, he writes, can also cause us to seek out new ways of belonging and places where we're helped to find a meaning for our lives, places where we may live out as an, an ideal, 
where we, may, where we may experience a true bonding with others. In the same way, this loneliness can cause us to search for new ways of bringing greater peace and justice to our society, to struggle with and for those who've been downtrodden so that they may find an equitable place in society. This is a loneliness that will push some to seek new ways of healing the broken and those who cry out in pain. It will push others to seek truth and a new relationship with God. Loneliness, friends, think about your, your own lives. Loneliness can be, is productive. And yet I'd hasten to add, none of this flurry of activity will guarantee the absence of loneliness. That's why we need to befriend it. Years ago, I found myself uncomfortable with the thought of even one evening at the weekend uh, by myself uh, at home. It didn't come out right. Being at home by myself on the weekend at night, scary. <laughs> In God's providence that semester, I lost my voice and had to stay at home for a weekend, uh, mostly alone, not even talking to people. But you know what? When I stopped running from my aloneness, it turned out to be so much more bearable than I'd thought. Here's Henry Nowen. Instead of running away from our loneliness and trying to forget or deny it, we have to protect it. You hear that? We have to protect it and turn it into fruitful solitude. To live a spiritual life, we must first find the courage to enter into the desert of our loneliness and to change it by gentle and persistent efforts into a garden of solitude. Befriend your loneliness, my friends. A second way we can plunder singleness and then rest won't be quite as long is to lose control. This may seem like kind of odd advice initially. Christians, after all, are filled with the Spirit and we're to yield the fruit of self-control, right? The loss of self-control hardly seems appropriate. It's, it's something embarrassing when it happens to us, something sinful. We lose self-control when we get wasted, when our impulses of lust or greed or anger take over. Still, I think it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Or better put, the self-control that the Spirit produces in our lives is not the same thing as the kind of control that we often seek. We want to be in control, to have all the moving parts within reach and within my power. Control is such a temptation in the single life. I've been dating going on a quarter century, as I mentioned, and that means I've thought about this stuff a ton. So when I kept not getting married, what did I do? Well, I, I adjusted. And then I adjusted again. Maybe, maybe I was coming on too strong. Or, or maybe, maybe not strong enough. Maybe I needed to kind of get out there and be assertive. Maybe, maybe it was me. Maybe it was her. I should go on some blind dates. I should try online dating. Some uh, counseling, maybe. I should try counseling. There's something wrong so deeply in me. I should be patient. I should just go for it. I should wait on the Lord. I should stop waiting on the Lord and get on with it and take some action. Do you know what all these approaches have in common? They assume that success in a romance, that is getting married, is a function of my figuring it out and finally getting it right. Think about it. When someone isn't married at, say, 30, people start to wonder, what's wrong with him? Is he too fill in the blank? If he's functioning properly, we'll assume he'll be married. Now, now, there are a host of problems with that, not the least of which is that it assumes that God's plan for each individual is marriage. I'll leave that to the side for now. But it also assumes that marriage is the achievement of the morally upright, the mature, the people who have their stuff together. The thing is, I know a lot of real life grown-ups who aren't married. And I know a lot of schmoes who are married. I, looked, I remember looking around at one point thinking, that dude's married. And that dude, and no, like this cannot be just about having all your stuff together. <laughs> the, uh, the, the editor of Christianity Today, uh, Caitlin Beatty, herself a single woman, calls this the marriage as maturity myth. If marriage makes one mature, then it might be that singleness doesn't. But surely it's truer to say that both marriage and singleness are soils in which the seeds of maturity can grow and ripen into fruit. But back, back to control. This last week in Tory, who was there for Midsummer Night's Dream? Had a good time talking about this, this play, this Shakespearean play. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is the play where you get the line, oh, what fools these mortals be. And that's just what about everyone in the play is. 
a fool. Also, about everyone play is a lover. And as you might expect from one of Shakespeare's comedies, there, there's plenty of mistaken identity, a number of foolish, fickle, and star-crossed lovers. The play starts a lot like Romeo and Juliet. And you might think that the, the inconstancy and rashness and indiscretion of these lovers will end up similarly. But where Romeo and Juliet ends in quick death in Midsummer, things they just kind of work out. Why? One of my students, hello if you're here, one of my students had the perfect answer. Why did they work out? She looked and she went, because of fairies? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's a perfect answer. The lovers go out into the forest, some fairies do magic stuff, and by the end of the play, you have a triple wedding. There you go. Here's what I love about this play. It defies explanation. It insists that sometimes things really do just work out, not because of moral perfection, not because of a kind of methodism according to which the lovers find the right recipe or follow the right plan or get the right steps in order, thus being rewarded with marriage. No, marriage in midsummer couldn't be further from a reward. It's a gift. And of course, all of God's greatest things that he gives us are gifts. They're not a function of moral perfection or methodism of us having figured it and sorted it out and being the perfect candidates for gifts. How do you be a perfect candidate to receive a gift? And marriage in real life is like that too. I remember one night, uh, true confession, I was dumped. Uh, maybe some of you have been dumped. One night I was dumped and the woman said to me, you haven't done anything wrong. You've been perfect. Now, small consolation, let me tell you. You're thinking, great, I've been perfect. This is what I get. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. Perfection isn't enough. You can do everything right and you will, may still not get what you want. But even more, perfection isn't necessary. It's not necessary. Sometimes things just work out. The best things in life don't come to us as rewards. They come to us as gifts, unheralded, undeserved. Well, it's not, of course, to discourage responsibility. Some of you, forgive me, some of you have no business dating right now. There, there's not many of you, but some of you, if that's you, you have no business dating right now. Please hear that. Uh, others of you are a bundle of anxieties and second guessing. Oh my gosh. Convinced that you, if you screw up one detail of your life, everything's gonna fall apart. If that's you, and it's me, for what it's worth, repent. Repent of your godless attempts to secure your own life. Repent of your closet assumption, you'd never say this in public, that your life is up to you, rather than being up above, hidden with Christ and God. And give up control. Throw it away. Fast, Lent's coming up, fast from the false and futile attempt to make your life by controlling your life. You can't do it. It'll exhaust you. And wonder of wonders, it's not even necessary. Recall Jesus' words. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, I mean, Jesus is not trying to butter them up. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The Father delights to give good gifts to his children. It is ours simply to ask, to live with open hands before our loving Father. If you're tempted by the twin demons of perfectionism and control, and most of us here are, Ask yourself whether that isn't merely a fancy way of saying that you don't trust that your father sees you, knows you, and is eager to give you good gifts. It's easy enough to call people away from their controlling ways. It's a lot harder to wean ourselves off of control. It really is like a drug in that sense, something we need, if for no other reason than that's the way we've gotten around in the world. Here's the th where the third way of plundering singleness comes in. Number three, fail boldly. You might have heard Martin Luther's counsel to his timid colleague Melanchthon to sin boldly. 
Now, Luther was a big opponent of sin, but his point was that Melanchthon could rely on the blood of Jesus that washed away his sin, that forgiveness ought free Melanchthon from being overly scrupulous about his sins. If we sin, John tells us, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The promise of forgiveness, coupled with the knowledge of a loving Father who delights to give good gifts to his children, ought to free us to fail boldly. I'm not sure quite what's happened, but we seem to be in a cultural moment when we're petrified of failure. Petrified to the point that we've lost our ambition, our dreams, our hope. I find Marilyn Robinson's evaluation exactly right. I think the true name for what we aspire to is non-failure, she writes. We hedge our bets. We save our money to guard against calamity. We make sure we never make a social faux pas. We anticipate any awkwardness and prepare a script ahead of time for how we'll handle it. Will you, will you look at this text and is it okay? I need to know from you too. Is this okay? I don't wanna, did I say that word? Everything, we wring our hands. We exhaust ourselves with contingency plans, with relentless examination of motives and messages. We are resolutely committed to non-failure. Do you hear the spirit of control in this? I don't think that's too strong a phrase, the spirit, of potentially the demonic spirit of control. Might it be that our desperate need to be in control has reduced us to managers rather than hopers or dreamers? People who no longer seek to live the abundant life of Christ, but who just want to make sure they don't blow it. Don Coe is coming next week in the Institute for Spiritual Formation, cautions us not to waste our life by trying not to sin. I saw that line from him recently. Don't waste your life by trying not to sin. Rather than pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, we live our lives making sure we don't accidentally step over any moral lines. We're so small. Instead, fail boldly. Fall flat on your face in a fearless attempt to follow Jesus and live his good life. Jean Vanier again speaks of living in a, de in a deliberately chosen spirit of risk, adventure, courage, and openness. He calls this a spirit of insecurity in the healthy sense that life is insecure. People get sick and die. Economies collapse. The elements unleash uh, a fury of destruction. Insecurity is the way of the world. But be of good cheer. Christ has overcome the world. We're safe and sound in him. We're sheltered in the promise of the resurrection. So we of all people ought to be risk takers. How do you live in your singleness? How tempting do you find it to be risk avoidant, to choose to pursue security at all costs by not ever dating, maybe? By only ever dating, maybe. By staying in that relationship that you should leave, doing whatever he wants. By leaving that relationship in which you should stay. I recently read Plain Song, a novel set on the eastern plains of Colorado. And at one point, a teacher, Maggie Jones, asked two bachelor farmer brothers, two older guys, to take in a 17-year-old pregnant girl. She needs a home for these months, she says. And you, she smiled at them. You old solitary bastards need somebody too. Somebody or something besides an old red cow to carry about and worry over. It's too lonesome out here. Well, look at you. You're gonna die someday without ever having, having had enough trouble in your life. Not of the right kind anyway. This is your chance. I want to die having had enough trouble the right kind. What a shame if we were to meet Jesus and say, I didn't blow it, and not having had any of the trouble of the right kind. I, I want to live in the spirit of joyful risk and adventure that opens me up to that kind of trouble. I want to fail boldly. Finally, and briefly, forge family. One more way to plunder singleness. 
Uh, I hope you've begun to get a sense for how the unique circumstances of being single really do afford opportunities for abundant life. That there are riches to plunder even in this not always friendly territory. Few treasures have been more precious to me as I've sought to plunder my singleness than spiritual family. Now, I wanted a family of my own for as long as I can remember. I just had my 20 year high school reunion. If you would have asked my friends in high school, who's the most likely to get married first? Totally, it was gonna be me. Didn't happen, no kids. But thankfully in God's kindness, after a Bible study my freshman year in college, a woman challenged me to grapple with Jesus's claim that his family are those who do the will of his father. I did, and then begin to respond in obedience to the implications of that claim little by little considering my brothers and sisters in Christ as family. And not just sentimentally, not nominally, but really so. It's the best move I ever made. We all need family, so much. And frankly, we all need a good bit more than a nuclear family. And here's one of the benefits of protracted singleness. I can't afford to ignore Jesus' words about family. Had I married young and had kids, maybe I could have pretended that they were all I needed. But I'd be missing so much of the life God has for me, for us. In the family of God, we embody his stunning reconciliation of strangers and enemies. My family is made up of rich and poor and black and white and young and old and male and female. My family has so many gifts. I wonder if I would have known this like I do now had I been married. Forging family among the people of God helps us befriend our loneliness. It helps us lose control and enables us to fail boldly. Here's Marilyn Robinson again. The antidote to fear, distrust, self-interest is always loyalty. The balm for failure or weakness or even for disloyalty is always loyalty. We've reasoned our way to uniformly conditional relationships. This is at the very center of the crisis of the family. Since the word family means, if it means anything, that certain people exist on special terms with each other, which terms are more or less unconditional. Unconditional loyalty. It doesn't mean unconditional approval. There's a lot about me and I guess about you that merits disapproval, but unconditional loyalty, an allegiance that sticks, one not subject to passing fancy, not, not, not even subject to affection, but grounded in the fact that we have one father who's adopted us in his only son by the power of the spirit who indwells us. The triune God's unconditional loyalty to us, his covenant faithfulness, calls forth our unconditional loyalty to him and to one another. This is something my singleness has taught me and beautifully so. A brief story will be done just a few weeks ago. December was hard for me. I don't know about you guys. January was hard. Stress and overwork were joined by deep loneliness. I was anxious, I was overwhelmed. And a couple weeks before school started, I was feeling increasingly unsettled. And Paul Spears, Tori's director and one of my best friends, has opened up his life and family to me to the point that I'm Uncle Matt. As we worked out at Biola Zone Fitness Center here, in the place where you have spiritual conversations, <laughs> on the elliptical machine, uh, I very seriously expressed to Paul my growing concern about the coming semester in light of how overwhelmed I felt. What if I can't do it? I worried. Well, Paul said, then I'll just come and sit with you in the ashes. And then I said, you're not supposed to make me tear up at the gym, you jerk. <laughs> <clears throat> that is loyalty, brothers and sisters. The balm for failure or weakness or even for disloyalty is always loyalty. Marion Robinson is right. What a treasure I've found in the spiritual family of those who do the will of the Father. I hope you'll find the same. I have no idea how long your singleness will last. Maybe for life. Maybe just a year. Maybe you'll find yourself single again years on due to the death of a spouse or divorce. But if you hear nothing else tonight, I hope you hear that there is such 
abundance of life to be found as you stay alert and attend to the riches that are just there for the taking in your singleness. It may not be the promised land of marriage you're looking for, but it sure is a land full of promises and presence, the presence of the God who sought you and found you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.